Hey, welcome back. Um, this video is the sort of first proper <laughs> video, so to speak, um, in which we're dealing specifically with the text, Plato's Republic. Um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to start right at the beginning, page one of book one, and I'm going to read some passages and then talk about them and, uh, you know, if there's more ideas there that I feel need to be sort of uh, unpacked or explained, I'll do that. Um, and with this with, with this video, um, I just plan on going fairly slow and just maybe going over the first two or three pages. So if you haven't already gotten your book out, you know, uh, just pause this and grab your book. Um, this, uh, this video will also be indicative of, you know, how most of these lectures will take place from here on out, and that is that we'll, we'll be doing it with, you know, our book in front of us, um, you know, reading along, and, 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 I'll be, and I'll be talking about it. Uh, so, yeah, we're just going to go over the first uh, couple of pages, um, and for the most part, book one is going to be one that we go over perhaps a little bit more slowly than the rest of them. So I'll, I'll probably end up making multiple videos about just book one, and then um, as you know, we go further into the text, I'll probably make fewer videos and just sort of jump to, you know, the, the sort of uh, specific passages that I want you to be um, aware of. And of course, you need to keep up with the reading schedule as it's laid out in the syllabus. So don't just read the passages that I take you to that you need to be able to see all of this put together, you know, as it un unfolds from the beginning to the end. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, so book one opens this way. Yesterday I went down to the Piraeus with Glaucon, Ariston's son, to offer my devotions to the goddess. I also wanted to see their new festival, uh, how their new festival would turn out. Our own citizens staged a fine parade, but even the Thracians were bored. So let's just take that first sentence, right? Um, Yesterday, I went down to the Prius with Glaucon Ariston's son to offer my devotions to the goddess. Now, you're not all of you, but I'm, I think that maybe many of you might be used to reading in such a way as you just sort of read for, you know, uh, major takeaways or looking for a key term or something like this. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot going on in this text. And, you know, in that uh, earlier video, um, when I talked about the Greeks and Socrates and Plato, and I suggested to you that one of the ways to read this work um, is to think of Socrates as, you know, the new hero, the hero that's replacing the older Homeric hero, uh, whether we're talking about uh, Odysseus or Achilles. And, you know, we see this from the beginning, and it's also, there's also various allusions throughout the text that, you know, sort of uh, suggest this, things that an ancient um, reader or listener um, would, uh, would catch. So, saying that, um, the first word in this translation is yesterday. So, if you remember what we said previously, you remember that there was these certain important terms or concepts associated with the, the philosophy of Socrates and, uh, and also with Plato. And one of those terms was an anamnesis, a recollection or remembering. And so with this work beginning with the word yesterday, we know that what takes place here took place in the past. And so this, the whole work of the Republic is a work of anamnesis or of recollection. It's something that's being recalled. And so it's um, telling us right off the bat that the work of philosophy, as it's going to be demonstrated here, is all going to occur by way of a memory, by way of something that's going to be brought forward from out of the past. And again, this is a this is an epistemological notion, but that is a theory of knowledge, right? Some people believe, uh, as, as other epistemological theories would be something like, we're born with a blank slate and everything we learn is sort of put in there by, you know, the, the, the society that raises us and our parents and all of that. Um, that is not the epistemology um, of, of, of Plato, of Socrates. Uh, maybe more Plato than Socrates. Uh, a lot of the more elaborate epistemological and metaphysical stuff is more Plato than, than Socrates. But saying all that, you don't really have to worry too much about that. But 
that amnesis is here, that recollection is here, that the that the that the truths that are going to be put forward are things that come from the past, or things that have to be recalled or remembered. Um, that that's important, and you can and you can see that right here. We then see this next phrase. I went down to the Piraeus with Glaucon Ariston's son. Now, the phrase "I went down," you, you probably weren't thinking there was much there. It was just uh, it just like, hey, yesterday I went over to you know went over to Bob's house or whatever. Um, but in Greek literature, there's this thing called the katabasis. Katabasis. The katabasis is translated as uh, a, a down going. This is indicative of a hero heroic journey. Socrates is the new hero. You know, heroes in the ancient world would sometimes descend into the underworld. That, that's, a, that's a sort of version of the katabasis. It could also be a more general ter term for like, you know, just the, the, the down going in terms of a, a, a tragic uh, event, right? Thing, things going south, things going down. Here, I mean, specifically, it's that they were in Athens, and then they go to the port town, the, the Piraeus, which is, you know, sort of um, connected to, to Athens. I, it's, you know, it's somewhat autonomous, but it's, it's largely considered sort of an extension of Athens. Um, and it's a port city, which means there's people coming and going. It's somewhat, you know, has the possibility of, like, exotic um, items that are coming, you know, that are part of, like, you know, trade. Um, also foreign people, uh, mixtures of culture and beliefs. You see that they're going down to the Piraeus, and he's going with Glaucon Ariston's son. If you, if you again, if you look, want to look up some names in the back, you can, and you'll see that uh, Glaucon is Plato's brother. It's not explicitly mentioned here, but if you, if you know that um, you know that that Plato also was a son of Ariston, then you you know you might get some, might realize that uh, that's who this person is. So in a sense, Plato is sort of. Uh, by extension, uh, present in the in this uh, dialogue as well. Um, but but we see that the reasons that they're going down to the Piraeus is to offer their devotions to the goddess. There's a there's a there's a new festival that's uh, being uh, introduced, uh, and it's going to be to this you know this new goddess Bendis, right? Um, and and the particulars of that isn't isn't uh, something you have to overly concern yourself with, but it. It tells us that um, it tells us that Socrates was um, someone who was interested in the gods. That Socrates took religious festivals, um, you know, somewhat seriously. And if you know anything about the life of of, of Socrates, you know that uh, one of the reasons that he was put to death um, at the age of seventy um, was he was accused of atheism. That he was accused of not believing in the city's gods. Um, you know, the three things that he was accused of was corrupting the city's uh, youth, um, which, you know, any good philosopher should be doing. Um, the other is that he was accused of being an atheist, not believing in the city's gods, and that he was also accused of uh, introducing strange and foreign gods. If you're interested in this whole narrative, it's sort of laid out a little bit more in length um, in uh, Plato's short dialogue uh, called The Apology, uh, or the, you know, the defense of Socrates. Um, in any case, we see here that, uh, and, and, and other passages throughout this text, that, that Socrates is, in fact, you know, someone who seems to be kind of interested in the gods and what the gods um, represent and what they have to say and, uh, and also in, in honoring them. And it gets really interesting, especially around the end of Book 2 of the Republic, because we see that he has a very radically different understanding of what the gods are uh, than it seems anyone else does. Um, but, but for now, we'll, we'll wait till we get there. Let's, let's just say that clearly uh, this is one of the important elements of the text, um, and with much of the great literature that comes down to us, um, you know, from time, from, from times past, um, a lot of all of the important stuff's right at the beginning, right? We, we, all of the sort of, whether you want to call it foreshadowing or, or whatever, that the important elements are, are here at the beginning. So we see this is an act of anamnesis, it's an act of you know, remembering, we see that it's um, that part of the the downgoing, part of the katabasis of the hero, right, Socrates. Um, whether or not this means that it's him going into the underworld, into the you know the place where he's going to have to do the work of philosophy and convince people who who aren't going to be convinced. And if if you think that chat, if, if book seven of the Republic, a lot of people think that's like the book of of 
And by book here, it's like chapters. So we're in book one. If you want to think of just chapter one, fine. But there's 10 books uh, in the Republic or 10 chapters. And book seven, a lot of people think that's like the big book um, because it's the allegory of the cave with, with what most people are familiar with. And so one of the ways to read the Katabasis is it's gesturing towards him going down into the, the cave, right? Not a literal cave, but, you know, a sort of an allegory of the cave, right? Where, where people are still controlled by convention and, uh, you know, um, beliefs uh, that aren't necessarily enlightened or uh, aware of the, of the truth. Um, so Katabasis, you know, um, anamnesis, Katabasis, and then also this idea of a, of a religious or uh, probably a better term is piety, right? The honoring of the gods. And uh, there's also a specific platonic dialogue dealing just with that topic. Um, so keep those elements in mind uh, as sort of important elements. They're all there at the beginning. And uh, anyway, so he goes down. Uh, he's going to participate in this festival. Festivals were really important to the ancient Greeks. You know, the games were festivals. If you're familiar with the Olympics, I'm sure you are. That originally was a, was a, a religious festival. So festivals and games, all these were very important to the ancient Greeks as well as poetry and theater. You know, a lot of that stuff we sort of take for granted. Um, some of us are more interested in that than others. But these are very culturally important things uh, to them. I mean, it was a chance... A festival is a chance to get together with uh, your friends, booze it up a little bit, um, to uh, feast, to, you know, to laugh, to also be, you know, also to show your piety towards the, towards the God that's being honored or towards the, uh, you know, the, the occasion, whatever it might be. Okay, so um, they've attended this and um, they're leaving, but as you see, if you read down the page, uh, that Polemarchus... Uh, the son of Cephalus, uh, sends his, uh, they say his boy, which is probably his servant or slave, he goes and he, he stops Socrates and makes him wait there, and then, then this other group of people catch up. Um, and then if you look down here, it says, uh, let's see. Um, soon, Polarmachus joined us along with Glaucon's brother Adamantus, Nicias' son, Niceratus, and a few others who had apparently marched in the procession. Um, then Polemarchus said, Socrates, it looks as though you and Glaucon are hurrying to leave us and return to Athens. So leave the Piraeus and head, head back up, I think it's like six miles to, to Athens. Uh, and Socrates says, that's a good guess. But do you see how uh, many there are of us? He says, of course. Well, you're going to have to choose between staying here peacefully or fighting us if you try to get away. How about a third choice, Socrates says, in which we persuade you that you ought to let us go? Um, but how could you persuade us if we don't listen? Now, I feel like that's a sort of uh, a good analogy just for <laughs> teaching in general. But um, and this is 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 that this is um, you know they're playing around. They're all friends. They're like they're not really going to beat them up or anything. It's it's uh, it's more like your friends trying to you know, gets you to stay at an event or a party or something like that, and you're ready to go, but they're like, you know, we'll beat you up if you leave. I mean, they don't really mean it. It's just, they're just, they're just joking, but they do, they do really want him to stay. Um, and he's like, well, let me persuade you to let me go. And they're like, well, if we're not open to persuasion, um, you know, how would that work? And, and, and even though they're joking, it's totally true. Um, if that people are insensitive to um, good arguments or to reason, if they are insensitive to um, you know, the why of something and all they care about is doing what they want to do or thinking what they want to think or believing what they want to believe, then, you know, persuasion can't happen genuine, um, even, even prior to persuasion, just genuine conversation, genuine philosophical conversations in which ideas are, are, are genuinely, um, authentically discussed, critically discussed, like that, that really can't happen. And I think in our society, you would probably, uh, you know, have to agree or being, I think you would be inclined to agree if you're paying attention that people are not uh, interested in having those kind of conversations largely. And because they're not, that makes persuasion impossible. And so people just talk past one another. People just, um, you know, talk to people that agree with them and then yell at the other people who don't agree with them. That developing some sensitivity or desire for truth, um, you know, desire to really understand what other people think, 
But this, all of this is really a sort of necessary psychological or emotional uh, comportment or attitude or way of carrying oneself so that uh, genuine conversations can take place, genuine dialogue can take place, and that, you know, philosophical, um, the dialectical philosophical process, we talked about dialectic last time, the scrutiny and refutation, question and answer, so that can take place as well. And of course, the reason to do this is because, you know, we, we want to become wise, philosophy, we want to, we want to know the truth. Um, so, if we jump ahead, we see that they go back to Cephalus's house, right? So Cephalus is the older man, um, that is, uh, that is, um, uh, Polemarchus's, uh, um, uh, father, uh, and let's see. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Okay. Um, they get back there. Uh, and they, they, everybody knows each other. Cephalus, you know, greets Socrates. Uh, Socrates finds him in the courtyard. He's sort of, you know, um, preparing his own sort of little household religious festival, you know, little shrine or altar to, uh, to the gods. Um, they talk and, um, you know, Basically, what happens here, and we're on we're on page. Uh, it's the second page of, of, of the dialogue. It's page twenty six in your text. Um, they're gonna they're gonna have a they're gonna have a long philosophical conversation. That's why they wanted Socrates to come back. Is that they they take convers like they're in, they are they are entertained by conversation. They 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 enjoy the leisurely stroll through thought and the exercise of rhetoric that's involved in conversations with Socrates. They they like the philosophical insights. Um, but if you look at the bottom of page 26, uh, you have Socrates saying to Cephalus, uh, this is the sort of um, second full paragraph up from the bottom, he says, Cephalus, I count conversations with very old people among my greatest pleasures. This is, so Socrates is saying this to Cephalus, who's you know, older, um, and he's telling him this because uh, Socrates believes that older people are further along life's journey, right? And I mean, like sort of literally are. Um, they are, they, they've lived longer lives. And so they have more experiences to, uh, to recall, to call upon, and that these can be sort of used for um, becoming more wise, that, that, that people should actively seek out those that have been around for a while, um, older folks, so that they can, you know, learn from their, um, uh, experiences that you know whether it's their mistakes or the things that went well or just the thoughts that they've um, you know developed uh, in time and he is he's he's also uh, it, let's just read the the, the bottom here um, at the very bottom he says the majority sentiment has it talking about old people this is uh, this is uh, Cephalus talking the majority sentiment has it that life was once sweet but that now because they're old it's not worth living um, some complain that they suffer indignities from friends and kinsmen and then continue on with a long list of misfortunes for which they blame old age. But he doesn't feel that that's right because he's not, he's not, uh, he's not unhappy. He's happy. He does, he can't do everything that he used to do. There's in the next paragraph, they, they're talking, uh, he recalls a story talking about Sophocles and someone asked Sophocles when he was really old. Again, he's a famous uh, writer of tragedy, Sophocles. is a famous poet. Now, you might have studied his work in Tigany in, a, in a, another class. Um, but they asked him if he, uh, if he could still make love to a woman. And, so and Sophocles was like, shut up. Like, I'm not interested in that. Like, I'm, I'm actually happy that I don't have to deal with that anymore. I can just live my life and not, not be overly concerned with, uh, with that type of stuff. And this isn't... You know, he's not demonizing sexuality or anything like that, but that, you know, that's uh, for, for someone like Sophocles, who is interested in the creation of art, that there are certain aspects of being, you know, more youthful um, and being somewhat impetuous uh, and, you know, somewhat more subject to inner passions and drives and desires that one of the benefits of getting older is that, you know, you don't have to wrestle with that stuff as much. And so this is just another way of sort of Cephalus saying, you know, if, if, if you're fortunate to be born into, um, you know, um, 
uh, a good family or to, you know, the, the, the gods smile on your business endeavors and so you're successful, uh, you know, that all their sort of different circumstances that, uh, but outside of that stuff, getting older can actually be quite, quite nice. You don't have to, you don't have to put up with as much things as you used to have to put up with. Um, and you can, and you can take, uh, you can make more time to do things that are actually, you know, intellectually pleasurable that are, uh, based more on the, the nature of um, uh, relationships or just your own idiosyncratic uh, interests and hobbies. Um, they talk a little bit about uh, money as well, and he sort of gets uh, Cephalus uh, to say that m money um, is something that makes life easier but it's not ultimately what makes one good or happy. And the reason is, is because we know people who have money that aren't happy and they're, and they're certainly not necessarily good. Um, it could be the case that money can make things um, easier on you. If you need something, you can get it. And we'll look at a passage here in just a second um, that, that talks about that. But um, that what, what Cephalus wants to argue is that whether you have money or not, whether you become happier or contented in old age is going to be a matter of how you live your life. Because there's just certain things that you don't control. Um, and so it's, it's going to be a matter of the virtue that you cultivate within yourself. Um, and if you look on page 27, so this is the, the third page in here, second paragraph, he says, the truth is, is that old age... Uh, brings with it an experience of tranquility and release in these and other matters. When passions, pressures abate, one is rid of a whole horde of lunatic slave masters. Fading sexual powers and snubs from one's relatives are not the serious problems of old age. The real cause of trouble or well-being, this is an important passage, so make sure you're highlighting this and noting this. The real cause of troubles or well-being is to be found in the character of the individual. So the wording is going to change later on, but I would argue that this is one of the sort of important passages that lets you know how they're going to define the main virtue that they're looking at, or, you know, sort of uh, justice, right? The, 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 the main theme of the Republic is what is justice, and how does one live a just life? And this is an early indicator of how that's going to happen, that really what justice is, is that justice is a matter of the character that one cultivates within themselves and then how they sort of, you know, are able to live that. Um, and the, someone could argue that that's, that's maybe not the case, but I'm, I'm arguing to you, I'm presenting to you the idea that, that that's going to be what Socrates puts forward, and we'll see that show up in book four. But the early articulation of it, the hint at it, the, the sort of winking in that direction, is uh, Cephalus saying all that other stuff that people complain about, not really the big problem. The real problem of whether or not you're going to be happy in this life and then, you know, the, the years ahead of you is if you develop character and live a life of character. That, that's really the only way um, of, of being truly and deeply happy. So I was going to look at one other thing real quick, um, and that is the idea of money. And this is on page 28. And if you look down um, to the last, second to last paragraph, um, he says, uh, th th he's quoting Pindar here, another famous Greek poet. Hope, the mainstay of our mortal purposes, warms his heart and shares his journey into age, his companion and his tender nurse. This is a fine, indeed a wondrous saying. This is the reward of virtue, and the chief value of wealth is to strengthen virtue, if not in every man, then in the good man. And the reason I wanted to read that passage is that this is sort of a theory of, of money. It's a, it's a theory of wealth. And that in the society that we live in, we tend to think about wealth, or at least many people, many people do, that you acquire wealth for your own sort of happiness and, and, and sort of uh, material uh, power to do things that you want to do. Even if doing that is like, you know, giving to a charity, but it's probably more stuff like, getting a house or going on trips or, or, or whatever, saving up for a you know, sweet retirement. Um, nothing necessarily wrong with those things, but what, what Socrates is arguing here is that 
the 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 real uh, value of accumulating wealth, um, the sort of virtue, the excellence, the arete of 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 wealth, is to live a better life. It is to be able to empower you and other people to live well in that sense of excellence that we talked about last time. And so it's not just that you can do whatever you want. I mean, that's fine. Um, but think of it as the relationship between having money and being able to live more morally or ethically, right? And, and I mean, what one could really make an argument that our world, uh, our society really needs to hear that. Uh, we, we People today tend to have the view that Money excuses um, a lack of character, lack of morality. He's making the case that, you know, the acquisition of it is something that should be directly tied to your ability to act more ethically. Um, you know, how that looks particularly, you know, we could certainly discuss and you can think about. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to pause, you know, uh, here for now. I'm, I'm going to try to keep these somewhat short and, and not, not go too far in any given um one of these lectures. Um, but for now, think about the early movements at the beginning. Um, think about those, uh, those terms that I introduced you to. Um, also think about uh, the, the sense of character in terms of happiness in this life in an old age. Think about this notion of wealth. And when we come back next time, I'm going to jump, start jumping into um, the, the couple of definitions of uh, justice that are going to be introduced in this text, and every and every definition that's going to be put forward, they're going to apply the Alinkus to it. It's going to be it's going to be scrutinized. And if it's going to be scrutinized, it's going to be refuted. And so the earliest definitions that are put forward will ultimately end up being you know uh, shown to be incorrect. Uh, but if you're patient, perhaps we'll get to later in the text. Um, we'll we'll get to something that uh, will will do a good job of defining justice for us. So uh, that's all for now. Uh, happy reading, and I'll see you soon.